Hi, I'm Daniel Mullen, and you're watching Pure Bed Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. G'day guys, and welcome to the Pure Bed Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. I'm your host, Ellis Gellios. We're in the studio today to preview our game against Melbourne Victory on Friday night. It's a huge game, and I'm joined by a uh, player of the past two seasons, a senior player and the younger brother of current midfielder Nathan Kostadopoulos, Kristen Kostadopoulos. How you doing, son? Good. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming in, mate. Um, now, you've uh, you finished up at Lady United in around September of 2019. Um, you've recently gone on and joined Adelaide Olympic for the current MPL season. Just, just tell us how things are going for you at the moment. Yeah, everything's going well. Um, just train hard, keep working. Trying to get in the best shape I can for the season to come. Uh, yeah, but everything's gone really well. Yeah, really happy, really positive. Yeah. Beautiful, mate. Well, um, we're going to get straight into things. So uh, we do play Melbourne Victory on Friday night. We're going to run through a preview quickly of that game, and then we're going to get on to talking a little bit more about you and uh, getting to know you more intimately, uh, specifically uh, for those United fans uh, who probably didn't see that many youth team games back in the day and uh, may not know you as well as mm -hmm. others do. So uh, we're going to find out a lot more about you uh, in the uh, in the next segment, but uh, just for now we're going to preview the game against Victory. So we do play Melbourne uh, this Friday, kickoffs at 7pm, and as always you can catch the game live on Fox Sports and the Carrier Sports app. No squads at the time of filming, but right now it's all about whether Mirko Bolin will be fit enough to make it into the team to play victory. Of course, uh, you know Mirko having trained uh, plenty of times mm -hmm. uh, with him last season. as an integral part of the squad last year. Now, first cap off the rank, Kristen has to be the sensational news that broke in the last 24 hours that Melbourne Victory have axed your former manager, mm. Marco Kurz, uh, after just 13 games. Now, I've got two questions. Uh, firstly, how surprised were you to see him go? And uh, as someone that's shared dressing rooms with very experienced players uh, through your own experiences as well, how much of a big deal can the new manager bounce be in professional football? Yeah, I had Marco for two years, obviously, and. Uh, he gave me my first opportunity with the club, so it was good to to be in that professional environment under him. Um, but yeah, um, going into a new new club like Melbourne Victory is a big club as well. It's always hard. Um, I don't know. It's a it's tough to take control of a new team so quickly. And I mean, it was surprising to see him go, kind of, because I thought they'd give him more of a chance, to be honest. But um, yeah, look, when it's a big club like Melbourne Victory is not getting results, they're gonna. They're gonna look for something else. So, how much uh, how much of an, a role did his um, playing style do you think impact on the decision? Uh, because obviously we know um, the way Marco Kurz liked to set out wasn't for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, do you think going to a club like Victory, almost like you know the Galacticos of the A League? Yeah. Um, you know, was that an issue? Do you think for him the fact he couldn't adapt? Obviously. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the coach always has a role, but like I think the players were always playing to the best of their ability and stuff. And maybe it wasn't just the coach that had the the impact. And maybe we'll see in the next few weeks if it was just the coach that had the impact. But Marco did have a strong philosophy that wasn't altered much. Like he believed in something, and he would just go that way. So like maybe that's why it wasn't working. He wasn't willing to change and whatnot. So maybe that's why I didn't go and he had to go. But. Yeah, well said, mate. Uh, so, whilst victory are clearly under the microscope, microscope, unfortunately, we have plenty of our own issues at the moment. Uh, the side has lost, lost five of their past six matches, and there is increasing talk that the team has a soft underbelly, conceding goals so easily while struggling to convert at the other end. Uh, now, you're close to a lot of these players, obviously, having just exited mm -hmm. the club very recently. Um, what's your view on why things have gone so badly in the last month or so? Yeah, um, I wouldn't say they have like, a soft underbelly and stuff defensively and whatnot. Um, I mean, five weeks ago, we were winning and won the FA Cup and whatnot. No one was saying anything, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's exactly like, right. All yeah. of a sudden now, we, got, we can't... We can't defend or whatnot, but we weren't considering many goals at all uh, at the start of the season. So I don't think you can pinpoint it on, on one thing. I think sometimes it's not just what you see from the outside when you see the players on the game day and whatnot. There's things that go on behind the scenes, which I, I'm not sure not being in it anymore. But there's always things going on that no one sees and uh, morale or whatever with coaches and whatnot. There can always be things going on. So 
I don't know, um, and on the other end, like in attack, we've always struggled, I guess, with, with finishing and whatnot, but I think it, it'll come. And sometimes it takes confidence from, from people above to give it and install in players. But yeah, I think, I think we can turn it around and whatnot. Maybe this week it can be that, that start for us. Psychologically, um, you know, when results aren't happening, mm. how much does that actually, you know, impact the team's, you know, desire to go out and win matches? I mean, obviously they want to turn it around yeah. as soon as they can, but, um, you know, is it a case of like there's less and less leaders about when results aren't happening, people are... Um, increasingly sort of under stress and sort of not really wanting to mm. go out and and just take risks. I yeah. mean, how much does it really hurt when when you you know against it? Yeah, it's, a, it's always tough when you're in when you're in a bit of a rut. And um, I think it's always like people are looking for how how, how we can get out of this and whatnot. Like, what do we do? But I think it's just about playing your game and just believing yourself. That's the main thing. Confidence is a big thing in football. And, I think that's the main thing for them, just believe in yourselves and go out and just enjoy yourselves. Don't worry about the results. So it'll come, just keep going and whatnot. Very interesting, mate. Uh, so Mike Moroni, he's just been awarded a one-year extension to his current contract, having recently notched up 150 senior appearances. Uh, he's now the second all-time uh, leading uh, cap winner for the club behind Eugene Galevic. Now, his preferred position is at right back, where you've also slotted in plenty of times mm -hmm. throughout your career. Um, as he's now considered a legend of the club, were there many occasions where he'd given you pointers in training? And uh, also, as a centre back, as centre back has now become a talking point in the team given the goals we're conceding, should Michael come in for LZ this week against Victory? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Mickey's a, a great person and a great player, so I'm, I'm glad to see he's got another year for himself. Um, but yeah, Mickey wasn't always the, the loudest person in trainings, but he'd always just show from you know, his desire to, to be good and or to, to... Let bikes out. Yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I'm trying to look for, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, in regards to Elsie uh, or Mickey playing, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, look, they're both good players and Elsie's done, had two really good seasons last past seasons mm -hmm. and whatnot. So I think he's he's come back from when he had a long-term injury and Look, he's he's a great player. And I, I don't know who should be playing one eye as the coach's decision, but I think both of them could do a job. And I think it's about belief again in the, in the players. So yeah, were you, were you personally closer to either one of them at all? Uh, they were always more of the senior kind of players when I was there. But like they were they were always great to me. And one eye, every player was always good to me. So I was close to both. But yeah, beautiful. Um, so. Uh, you played with George Blackwood as well, obviously. Uh, now, many fans feel that he's got a lot to still offer this squad. However, um, being a professional yourself, uh, you have to agree that uh, there's certainly going to be scrutiny on a striker who's not scoring goals. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you persist with him up front for this game, or should Christian Opseth, if he's fit, come in and, uh, and re-enter the starting eleven? What are your views? Yeah, I was close with George, and like... If you see Jordan training, he's well, maybe one of the best players there. He's just he's so good, <laughs> and so that's why it's been hard. But maybe he hasn't scored as many goals as he would like. But um, look, he's a great player, and um, I think he's got so much to offer. And uh, I think he needs someone that's gonna stick by him and believe in him and play every week and whatnot. So I don't know. But I haven't seen a lot of Christian. Or I was only there for a little bit when he was there. Yeah. So I don't know too much about Christian. But um, look, they're both from what I know, good players and stuff. So. Once again, it's the coach decision. I can't really make the decision, but sure. Yeah. Um, obviously, you'd know George quite well then, um, you know, better than most of us training with him day in, day out. Yeah. Um, is one of the issues with him uh, just not being able to actually identify his best position as yeah. a player? Is that is that a problem for him? I think he's been moved around a lot by the last few coaches as well and stuff. And it's it's like just that everywhere. Yeah, it's not always good when you're, you're trying to <laughs> cement his position, which I know as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm not sure. Um, he he would know himself what his best position is. I think he's a striker, but yeah, it's always hard as a striker because there's always the scrutiny. You have to score goals and whatnot, and you do obviously <laughs> to be successful. But yeah, I think he just needs to find what's his best role. Yeah. Yeah. No. Very interesting indeed. Um, so, from the psychology of a professional, uh, I'm interested to know how much playing your biggest rival, particularly when you're in a form slump yourself, uh, how, how much can it boost? Your motivation. 
yeah, I haven't been really involved in many rivalries to be honest, but um, yeah, I mean, for me, every game is a big game, but obviously, victory is a, a huge game, it's just going to make it more exciting and more raring to go, um, especially with all the fans behind and whatnot. It's always a, a big day, so yeah, I'm sure all the players will be really excited and ready to go for this one. Um, even playing victory at a youth level, mm. um, did that have the same kind of feeling to it as what we would imagine goes on in the dressing room when it's at an A-League level? Um, not really for the youth level, to be honest, because there's not many crowds in the youth games yeah. and whatnot. But um, it was always good playing victory because we'd always play in like some of the stadiums and whatnot, which was always exciting. So yeah, that was always good. But most of the youth games were always the same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. to be honest. Okay, very interesting. Um, so. I like your prediction, first of all. What do you think is going to happen in this one? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I think it's going to be a draw. Or yeah. One or, one or draw, I reckon. A lot of people are saying that. Yeah. Just easy to sit on the fence. <laughs> who, who, um, who scores for us? Should I say my brother? <laughs> no. Why not? Uh, yeah, I'll say Nathan if he comes on. Is, is he a goal? He scored a few crackers in preseason. Yeah, he did. That's, yeah. that's the best thing you can do in preseason. That's it. <laughs> um, now, uh, before we wrap up our previous segment, Daniel Mark Gush is a mm-hmm. keeper. You came through the youth ranks with, uh, and he was just recently granted an early release. Uh, by the club from his contract to try to secure more first team football. Uh, is there any doubt in your mind that he's eventually going to make it as a first team regular? No, nah, there's no doubt for me. Uh, Daniel's always been a great player ever since I've known him um, and really hard working, which I always like to see in the player. Um, so I think it's a good move for him to, to look for more game time. He needs it. He's been there for a long time. Hasn't got the game time maybe he wanted, uh, which obviously he wanted. Uh, I don't know about the club if it's a good move because I think Daniel is a good player to have um, and should have got more of an opportunity I think in my opinion but absolutely but it's always hard because it's one key to the place but um, yeah I think good on him for making a move and trying to find some more game time yeah you played with Isaac Richards as well yep. who's uh, overtaken him um, in the uh, in the goalkeeper mm-hmm. order um, I mean, it must be really interesting to just to look back from your perspective as an outfielder and see like how many good keepers have come through yeah. at the club and the fact that Mark Gush's trajectory was going so well mm. and then suddenly just not even in contention anymore. Yeah. Like that, that, that's how quickly, um, you know, in football, it can just be taken away from you. Yeah, it's always, it's especially hard for keepers, but um, the coach's opinion has a big influence on everything, you know. If a coach doesn't like you, you know, and it's just tough times, you know what I mean? Yeah, Sometimes course. it's just different people's opinions and whatnot because, you know, uh, Mark Gush is with the Australia team and whatnot, he's doing mm-hmm. really well. So, I mean, I know Isaac as well, and he's a great keeper and a great guy. So, both of them deserve opportunities and whatnot. So. Mark Gush was around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Isaac Richards hasn't been in the senior setup that long. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen a couple of games out of him, but uh, for fans that uh, are not overly aware of what kind of keeper he is, um, what can we expect from Isaac sort of going forward? I mean, you play, you know, um, consistently alongside him. Mm. Um, you know, what, what kind of goalkeeper is he? Uh, yeah, he's a great, he's a really good shot stopper, um, really aggressive and takes control of situations. Um, and yeah, he's also a really hard working guy that I don't know. And he's um, yeah, he's got huge potential, and he's yeah, he's a great keeper. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Well, uh, that does us for our preview. We're gonna now move into mm-hmm. a bit of a biographical interview um, where we find out a lot more about uh, the not only player but the man, Kristen Shostakovich. <laughs> so uh, let's get straight into it, mate. So uh, you had a blistering career as a junior in South Australia. You played. Uh, firstly at the Adelaide Comets where your development began and then went on to play at uh, West Torrens, McCalla, the Skillaroos, White City and Adelaide Olympic uh, as well as a stint with the United Youth Team uh, all in the lead up towards signing as a senior player for Adelaide United. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, you've been around. Uh, Now (laughs) firstly let's discuss uh, some family dynamics here. So your older brother Nathan's uh, as we know currently a midfielder um, in the senior team and he's gearing towards 50 appearances as well which is a a massive effort from him because um, he obviously had he started off at United, then yeah. went to Brisbane Raw, mm-hmm. and uh, whilst sort of struggling to cement him, his place 
as a regular mm -hmm. starter yeah. uh, to still notch up 50 appearances uh, in the relatively short time he's been at the club is uh, says a lot about him. Yeah. Um, anyway, moving forward, so uh, we know about Nathan, and then perhaps some of us don't know about Jason, who's uh, in the youth team currently. Mm -hmm. Your younger brother. Um, now, at present. You and Nathan are one of only two pairs of brothers to have both played senior games for Adelaide United. The others being the Costas, Anthony and Joe. Mm -hmm. um, now, if Jason uh, eventually makes a senior debut, the Kozadopoulos family are going to hold a very significant record yeah. in this state. Surprisingly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it says a lot. It really does. Yeah. I mean, to have three brothers all play senior games for, for Adelaide United, the only professional club in the city. Um, that's massive. And uh, if it happens, I don't think it's going to be matched again, possibly in our lifetimes, um, yeah. given how rare it is. Yeah. Uh, so some very interesting stuff to go off there. Um, now, uh, what was it like for you growing up in such a football orientated family? Uh, obviously your dad, George, um, you know, very, very uh, football centric person mm -hmm. as well. Um, what was it like growing up with football being such a prevalent part of your upbringing and, and also how much of a uh, role did uh, your dad, George, play in, in your own development? Yeah, um, I mean, we loved, we just loved playing football when we were younger. Um, it was never like something that was forced upon us. It was just like there was balls around the house and we'd get a ball and we'd just play, you know, muck around and stuff. And always like, me and Nathan were always close in age, so we just always played together and we were really competitive, so we'd always be trying to beat each other and whatnot. Um, but yeah, Dad had a, a big role in football for me and for my brothers. Uh, he just, he always gave us the opportunity and believed in us and just made me learn that hard work is what gets you places and that's why all three of us are, are getting far, I've got pretty far. Um, so yeah, I've just, he's been yeah, a big role, a mentor for me. So. Yeah, it's been great for all of us. Yeah. Um, like, was it was football? You know, the the only thing really going on for a long amount of years there growing up. I mean, was, was it the main focus? Um, not really. Uh, it was, but it wasn't because it, yeah, it was never forced on us. But we wanted to do it. Um, but then Dad was always really heavily like we needed to be smart and educated. And if you know now, like Nathan's studying law still, and I'm studying the exercise sports science and to move to physio and. Jason's just as smart and whatnot at school, so it was always like, yeah, we loved playing soccer and we wanted to pursue it, we knew that, but um, it was always focused on schooling, we always did taekwondo and stuff as well, just to keep fit and whatnot, but it was never a huge focus, but we just loved doing it, you know what I mean? Um, Westminster, did you, uh, yeah. did you play many intercoals ever? Not really, to be honest, because of club soccer and whatnot, I was involved with that in state yeah. stuff, it was like, uh, when I could play, I'd play, but... I wasn't involved with too many actually. I think I played one and we, we smashed them. So. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? Out of interest? I uh, have no idea to be honest. Probably 2012, 2013, somewhere around there. Killer. Yeah. Um, so all three brothers went to Westminster? Well. Yeah, it was a bit of a weird one because it was like a 35 minute drive from my house to live in Westlake. So it was <laughs> yeah. a bit of a weird one. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Awesome stuff, mate. Um, so in your second stint at the club, you were heavily involved uh, with the youth team under Paul Pezos. And featured in that fantastic 2018 MPL campaign where we finished fourth on the table, followed by last year's eighth place finish. Um, just before I ask you about Pez, uh, the 2018, that's mm -hmm. kind of undersold how good of an achievement that was by that team to finish fourth. Yeah. Um, you know, a finals appearance. I mean, if you look at all the other A-League clubs playing in their respective MPLs, mm -hmm. Some of them aren't even in the top tier, yeah. let alone sort of making finals and, and mm -hmm. really impressing a lot of oppositions. Um, what kind of went on in that year to, to have that kind mm -hmm. of belief? Such a young team as well. Yeah, we had a really talented team actually. Um, yeah, as you can see now, a lot of these players have progressed to Louis playing now and whatnot. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was just a good environment, a good team, and yeah, Pez, uh, testament to Pezos as well. Um, he was. Yeah, great to have us, uh, great to lead us as well and whatnot. But yeah, it was, it was great to be a part of and a, and a great team to be a part of as well, yeah. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of players around the scene that um, sing the praises of Paul Pezos as a development coach. Um, you know, did, did, did he bring your game quite far as well? Yeah, um, uh, Pezos was always, uh, yeah, he was a great person in regards to 
tactics and stuff. He was always really, he had a lot of knowledge in that area in football as well. Um, it was hard for me because I was always with the first team and I was with the youth team and I was, there wasn't always the best relationship yeah. in regards to when totally. Mark was there. Yeah, um, and I'd get moved around in positions quite a bit, which was always hard for me. So that was a bit of a tough one, but it also, Pesos helped develop my defensive game a lot because I've been playing as a right back a lot with Pesos and even now like, I'm playing right back for Olympic and it's really helped me def- develop that part of my game. So, yeah. Ideally, if, um, you know, if you had it your own way, where would you be playing on the park week in, week out? Oh, it's always hard because I've always been a midfielder mostly, but um, now when I see myself, like I see myself as a good right back. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think it's probably best for me to play as a, as a right back and I can make it far, I think, as a right back. So, yeah, I love the position. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Uh, so, uh, that brings us to discussing your debut with the club. It was a momentous occasion in which we managed to grind out a scoreless draw against arguably the most formidable team in the competition in Sydney FC. And um, we had a lot of players out on this day as well. So we had a lot of young players step in, uh, including the likes of yourself. Now, what did it mean for you to make your professional debut in front of our home fans in your home city? It's a special thing. Yeah, that was really special. Um, yeah, you can't put it into words. It's just a great moment because you've been dreaming about doing this stuff your whole life. and. Me and Nathan used to go and watch the games at United uh, at home much all the time. So it was just to get onto the pitch and be, it's, just, yeah, it's a really good feeling. Um, yeah, I wish I could have felt more more of those feelings, but uh, yeah, it was it was quite quite unbelievable. Yeah. What uh, like where was your head at throughout the day before mm-hmm. before it happened? Like, are you nervous? Are you? I mean, obviously you are to a degree. You're yeah. Kind of feeling everything, but I'm interested to know exactly kind of mm-hmm. what headspace you're in. I mean, because we knew there was going to be a lot of plays out for this game. It was kind of like I was like, oh, I might be even starting for this game on one of the adventures. It's just like, yeah, I'm ready to go. I want to, I want to play. I want to play. Um, and then before you're obviously nervous or not, but like once you like get onto the field, it's just all goes and just excited. Like, if you watch me, I'm just back and running around like an idiot the whole time, just wanting to get the ball, like in the playground, so yeah. So you were just pumped? It was just you four? Yeah, I was pumped to go and ready. Yeah. 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 Wow, there you go. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> um, so, Marco Kurz uh, is currently making all the headlines after being removed from his role as Victory's head coach. Now, you are under Kurz throughout the majority of your time as a senior player with the Reds, but your opportunities were very limited. Um, now, I just read uh, an article that uh, suggested one of the main reasons Kurz actually went from Victory that's not being spoken about very much is the fact that uh, there was no evidence that uh, youth was coming through. Um, there were murmurs that that was an issue back in your time at Adelaide United as well. Um, I guess what I want to kind of ask you is, are you able to shed any light on uh, why it was um, apparent that uh, Marco was disinterested in, in you know, giving youth more of an opportunity? Mm-hmm. Because obviously um, you've come in there very early after rejoining Adelaide United, made your senior debut and then suddenly on the outer again. And that was the case with uh, a lot of those players, uh, particularly Armiento and Dorigo, who you mm. came through as well, obviously a very different ball game for Louis Dorigo now, yeah. but back then he wasn't getting much of a sniff at all, and obviously yeah. Carlo Armiento had to leave and go to Melbourne Victory just mm. to um, just to try and work himself back into some kind of first team plans. What went on? I mean, yeah. you know, you've just you've just pointed out how you were in a difficult position of of being the ham in a sandwich mm. between youth and seniors. Yeah. Um, what, what, what were the main issues? What went on? Yeah, um, I don't know what was going on with... Yeah, it was tough because I think Marco just wanted to win and obviously he wanted to win and he didn't believe that the young players could do so as much. Um, I mean, he played some young players, but it was... Especially in the second year, it was more like, okay, I'm just going to win games and do what I need to do to win games. And it was like, maybe if you give the young players a chance as well, they can show something, you know what I mean? It was just... It was frustrating for me because it was like... I just never got the opportunity <laughs> to show myself and like if I did and then I um, did poorly and then it's like okay he didn't got the opportunity but he didn't it was good enough but it was like I never got the opportunity to show if I was good enough and that's what was frustrating for me um, but yeah it's it's always tough with yeah, different coaches have different opinions and um, perhaps that is the reason why a victory he went but it's good to see now that Louis getting a chance and whatnot and hopefully Carla does as well where he's at Melbourne City um, as a young player, 
Is it really difficult when you're getting mixed messages between both coaches? Um, yeah. Because obviously, uh, you know, Paul Pezos is, is all about, um, you know, playing on the front foot. Mm. And um, we didn't always see that that occurs. Mm. Um, I could even take you back to your debut. Like, what, what were the instructions given to you that day? Obviously, it was a, you know, a pragmatic approach. Mm. Um, you know, so you can't really go out there and, and you know, showcase yourself, mm. I guess. I mean, was yeah. that was that kind of what went on that day as well? Yeah, um, yeah, I can't really remember. <laughs> so, <laughs> a blur yeah, for me now. But, been a while. Since, yeah, yeah. And that game was mostly about just holding the draw, to be honest, because it was a big Sydney team and we had a lot of players out, so it was mostly about defending and whatnot. But, um, yeah, Pets also always had, diff- it was hard because usually most clubs, it's like the youth teams, the same kind of thing as what the first team's doing. But yeah, it should be like that. It should be like yeah. that. But with, yeah, in the last couple of years, it hasn't been like that. And it was just like, you learn some things with the first team, you learn some things with the youth team. It's like, well, what do I take on? What do I do in each one? It was, it was weird and tough. And that's what made it so difficult for some of those young players. Like, to implement stuff yeah it's absolutely fascinating to hear that mm-hmm. mate because uh, a lot of people uh, who were you know massive Marco Kurz fans don't seem to understand why other people were not as keen on him mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes it's really interesting to hear these stories yeah. about um, you know why as a young player it was so difficult for you to yeah. to break through when you should have been given more opportunities mm-hmm. g- g- given um, you know how your career had spanned out and the fact that um, you know you were Award of a senior debut at a very young age, mm. um, you know, that suggests he should have been given far more opportunities than he were. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting to hear that. Mm. Um, obviously, very difficult for you um, being in that position where you're probably too good to constantly be around the youth team and rely on in the youth team, mm. um, but then just not given enough opportunities to to really make something of yourself at a senior level. Yeah. Um, so would you would you sort of agree that's kind of the way it was? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, you always look at yourself and things go happen and you're like, was I good enough? Maybe I wasn't good enough. And, but now getting away from it all, it's like, I've never been so confident in my ability and like, I know I'm capable, I know I want not. So it's just about progressing and trying to get back and whatnot. So. Um, no worries. So, um, We've obviously spoken about the fact that you've joined Adelaide Olympic, uh, so it brings us to the present time, Kristen, where um, you have uh, signed on to play uh, at a club where you were as a junior for the 2020 NPL season. Um, now, Adelaide Olympic captured the hearts of many South Australian football fans with their success throughout 2019 in the FFA Cup. Um, is the club endeavouring to go one step further this season, and what are some of your personal goals going into this season's NPL. Yeah. Um, yeah, Olympics always trying to progress further, which is always great to see, and that's why one of the reasons I want to go back to them. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully for a good season from us. Um, yeah, for myself, it's just more about enjoying myself and yeah, enjoying my football, but also just while I'm still at this kind of age where I can still do something with myself, I want to try and progress. So this year is about yeah, doing well for myself and having a good season and trying to progress either whether it's back to the A-League or whether it's overseas or whatnot and just trying to make something of myself while I can. Uh, you're only 21. Uh, George Sonis, is he the man that can uh, get you back into that sort of frame for the A-League? Yeah, George is a, a great guy and I think it's important sometimes to have someone that, as a coach that's just believes in the players and that's what I get from George and someone that I can showcase whatever what I want to do and just be me and be myself you know what I mean be myself like I am and at home and, or in the playground and whatnot just play and enjoy myself which is great beautiful and why Olympic uh, there's still people around from uh, when you were there as a junior what, what yeah, brought you there yeah it's a good uh, one of the most family orientated environments uh, in the NPL South Australia so that's why I want to go back there and I always have great memories when I was at Olympic so there's still great people around, that's why I like, yeah, I'm happy to be there. Mm. Beautiful. Kristen Cosendopoulos, uh, as well as playing for Adelaide Olympic, uh, you've briefly touched on the fact that you are doing a uni degree. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess you're in this um, kind of uncertain but exciting point in your life where it could go any way, like, it, you know, one of any direction. Um, you know, so if it's not going to be professional football, which we all hope for your sake it will be, mm-hmm. um, where do you aspire to go with uh, with your studies at the moment? 
Yeah, so I'm doing exercise sports science at the moment, but I'm um, looking to do my master's in physiotherapy. So that's the main area I want to go down that way. But I'm just kind of going with the flow and just <laughs> seeing what happens and enjoying life. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see what happens. Beautiful, Kristen Kostandopoulos. It's been great having you on, mate. We wish you all the very best uh, with the MPL this year and, uh, and beyond. I'm sure we'll be seeing your name again uh, very soon um, at a higher level. Um, thanks so much for stopping by. It's been fascinating interviewing you, mate. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you a lot. All the best. Thanks, man. Cheers.